days with you and uh, appreciate your love for us. And uh, we not only are brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're the Hopewell family. And that's a blessing. I mean, it really is to my heart. For 28 and a half years, the Hopewell Baptist Church family has never had to wonder who their pastor was going to be. And it's a blessing to know those of you that are faithful, solid church folk that you're here and this is your church and we're your family, all of us together. And it's just such a blessing. I sure do love you and appreciate you. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. I thought it'd be appropriate on Christmas morning for us to read both passages in the Bible about the Christmas story. And I'm going to give you a five-point outline, five lessons from the Christmas story. That's the title of my message this morning, five lessons from the the Christmas story. And uh, we're going to read both uh, chapters, one in Matthew, one in Luke. So in just a moment, when we finish Matthew chapter 2, the rendition of the Christmas story, we're also going to read Luke chapter 2. All right, Matthew chapter 2, look down at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, Art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, gold, and frankincense and myrrh and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod they departed into their own country another way now if you would please look at Luke chapter number two Luke chapter number two we're going to begin reading um, in verse number one Luke chapter number two verse number one we're going to go all the way down to verse number 20. Luke, God bless you. Luke chapter number two and verse number one, the Bible says this, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel 
the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the, by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. All right, five lessons from the Christmas story. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you, Jesus, for being the greatest gift ever given. What a wonderful Savior you are. And Lord, I hope tonight, uh, this morning, as you look down from heaven, you have a smile on your face because these people are gathered together here at Hopewell on Christmas morning simply because we love you. And we want you to know we are grateful that you came to earth. And this is the best way that we know how to honor you on the day that we celebrate your birth. And now, Holy Spirit of God, please give me your power. Bless every person who's here. Uh, help them to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. Bless those who are watching online. Father, please do a work in our midst that only you can do. And we'll give you all the glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. As I think of the Christmas story, there are five things that come to my mind that I would like to share with you that I think would be worthy to note, as well as, understandably so, trying to apply it to our lives. You know, I think one of the dangers that we have as Christians, and when we read the Bible, especially stories in the Bible, I believe that we sometimes have difficulty thinking that these are not normal people like you and I. These are, they are, they are normal people like you and I, and they are, they are people that were married, that had children. I know sometimes when people uh, talk about, well, I just don't have time to go to church or time to live for God or time to do whatever, you know, um, they think, well, the people in the Bible days, they had more time. No, man, they're just like you and I. They, they were married, most of them. They had children, most of them. They had jobs. They had houses that they lived in. I mean, the only difference between us and them is just maybe the advancement of the human race, the technology. I mean, we have cars and the Internet and indoor plumbing and electricity, and they didn't have any of that. But, I mean, as far as the society as a whole and, 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 and living, they lived in like manners as you and I live. And I want you to imagine yourself to be in the story as, as far as being around and being able to relate to them. Look at Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at three points from Matthew chapter 2, and then the last two points will be from Luke chapter 2. If you look at verse number 1 of Matthew chapter 2, it says this, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Look down at verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. The first uh, lesson I would like to present to you from the Christmas story is this. Worship Jesus on this day. Worship Jesus on this day. You see, the wise men came from the east, and the number one reason they came to see Jesus was to worship him. You know what they said? You know what they said? The Son of God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings is here on earth, and we want to worship him. Now we know now that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and that he's waiting to come back again, 
But here's what he's done. He's left his Holy Spirit with us. He's left his presence, if you please, in spirit with us. We have an opportunity 52 weeks a year on Sunday to come to the house of God where the presence of the Lord is and to gather together and worship him. No, Jesus is not here on earth in 2022 in a physical body. If he, yeah, I'm just going to tell you right now, if he was here in a physical body right now, I'd do whatever I could to get to him and be in his presence and worship him in presence, right? His physical body. I would like to think that if I was alive 2,000 years ago and if I had lived in the East like these wise men were, I, I would like to think I would have been one of them that would have caravaned and made that journey to find where Jesus was to be able to worship him. I mean, I really think, I would like to think I would have done that. I, I, I don't think think I would have said, oh, yeah, I heard Jesus is, you know, okay, let's, let's just suppose it's America, right? And, oh, yeah, he's in New York City. Yeah, I heard Jesus is there. That's interesting. Wish I could be there and see him. <laughs> no way, Jose, that wouldn't have been me. I would have been saying, let's do whatever we can to get there. And I would tell my wife, come, honey, my kids, let's go see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and let's go worship him. Well, obviously on his day, Christmas Day, it's good to worship him. You know, I don't necessarily mind parents that include Santa Claus and all the different uh, secular festivities. I don't necessarily think that parents that do that, they're of the devil and they're evil and wicked. I personally have never chosen to do that. My kids have been raised from birth till now. David's 27 years of age never having Santa Claus as a part of our Christmas celebration. Um, never have done that. But the fact of the matter is, um, if you do that, always, always make sure you include the worship of Jesus on Christmas. That's what it's all about. Yes, Christmas giving, presents, family, meals, enjoying each other's company, all of that is fine. All of that is okay. But the number one thing about this day we should be worshiping Jesus on this day. But hang on for a second. Let's learn from these wise men that, and again, I've taught you this, it probably took them two years to get to Jesus. It wasn't just the fact that they worshiped him on Christmas Day. It was they spent two years of their life looking for and finding him and then worshiping him and the fact of the matter is we ought to worship him every single week of the year Sunday is a great opportunity for you to be in God's house don't let things um, deter you from that let's say Lord I want to worship you I want to be like those wise men because you came to earth and uh, and and your presence was on this planet and they said we got to go to him and see him and worship him I know that God's physical presence is not with us but his spirit is here and this is his house, and he's with us today in spirit. We can worship him. Let's be like the wise men and worship Jesus. Then number two, look at verse 11. The second lesson I'd like to give you is found in verse 11, and it simply says this, and when they were coming into the, in, into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. Number two, write this down. Bring Jesus gifts of value. Bring Jesus gifts of value. Now listen this carefully. I believe that every single word in the Bible is there for a reason. I believe it's all important. These gifts that they were bringing to Jesus were not tithes. This wasn't them tithing. Tithing automatically belongs to the Lord, or the tithe automatically belongs to the Lord. We should always honor God by giving him, obeying him, and giving him our, his tithe. That's his. That's always his. But a gift is something that is ours that we choose to give to the Lord. Now, notice this, the wording. It says, when they had opened their treasures, all right? This wasn't, okay, for example, a lady opening up her purse and looking at the bottom of the purse and seeing, oh, I got any coins I can give to the Lord today. This wasn't a man 
opening up his wallet saying, oh, do I have any spare change that I can give to the Lord? No, this was their treasures. This was something that was valuable. This was something that was, if you please, costly. And they were happy to give gifts to the Savior. The three gifts that are mentioned, obviously, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they're all symbolic. They all have meaning. But the fact of the matter is, gold, obviously, it represents money. I mean, it, it, that's just what it is. It represents that. And in the Bible days, especially when the world was ruled by kings, uh, basically, you know, people always brought their gold to the king. I mean, by way of taxing, of course, but nonetheless, that's what they had to do. And so Jesus is our king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And yes, we should be bringing our gold to him. That's exactly what they did. And again, this is not tithing. This is, this is extra. This is something that is our treasures. Then it mentions frankincense That's a, and myrrh. And, and that had some uh, sense of um, a sweetness of, of savor, it, a smell. And then the, it was myrrh, I believe it was, is representing uh, his upcoming burial and, and his death so that in preparation for that, because the reason Jesus came was not just to be among us, but to be our savior, to die and to pay for our sins. And so they brought these three gifts of value and they said, we want to present these to our king. You know what? I think it's good that we do the same. One of the things that discourages me about American-based Christianity is that it's so cheap. It's so cheap. People look for convenience. People look for what does not cost them. People want to have a relationship with God without it costing them anything. It just all needs to be free. It all needs to be um, all about grace and nothing else. I feel like our society has corrupted our thinking when it comes to things like the social services and welfare department of our country. Um, first of all, I think it's unbiblical that the government participates in any of that uh, 100%. I, I believe that God ordained in the Bible that his house, his people, the church, would be a source of helping people, widows. It's, it talks about orphans and widows specifically, you know, pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this, that, um, that you, you, you take care of the orphans, the, the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and in their time of need. Um, I, I sincerely believe it's, it's that way. The Bible uh, talks about um, elderly people caring for them. Um, anybody that has the ability to work should work though. I mean, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he should need uh, those that have the ability to work need to work and that's that's a biblical practice but I believe in our society one of the negative effects side effects if you please of the government being involved in this welfare society of ours and and um, people going to the government like the government owes them a place to live the government owes them food the government owes them health care and then the government owes them education none of that is true none of it is but with that mentality that our culture has cultivated we see we, a lot of people do the same thing with with jesus you owe us you know, church, you owe us blessings. Uh, you know, we don't have to give anything. It's just take, 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 take. And, and, and that discourages me. I, I don't want to have a relationship with my Savior. That it's all about him giving to me and me not giving anything back to him. He is deserving of gifts. Not just on this day. And by the way, you've heard me say this before. Um, I give Jesus a present every single year, a financial present. And I always give Jesus a present in value greater than any other individual that I give a present to in my life. I, I've made the analogy. If I give my wife a $200 Christmas present, I'm going to give Jesus at least $201 of a Christmas present. I'm not going to give someone more attention and value and my treasure on the day that we celebrate his birth. I'm not going to give anybody else something more valuable than I give to him. And that's just my practice. It's not a biblical command. None of these gifts 
are necessarily commands. But you ought to give them gifts, not just on this day. But why don't you be a giver and give to him all throughout the year? That would be a great way to live. Number three, look at verse number 12. In verse number 12 of Matthew chapter 2, it says this, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed unto, into their own country. Another way. Number three, if you're taking notes, I wrote this down. Be different. Be a different person because you met Jesus. Be a different person because you met Jesus. You know, when you meet someone great, and I mean someone great, they rub off on you. They affect you. Being in their presence makes you a better person. It changes you. And I know the story specifically talks about these wise men going back home a different way because they didn't want to go to the king so that the king could cause problems for, you know, the Savior. He wasn't really wanting to come and worship the Savior at all. He was wanting to kill him. And, um, and, and I know that when they departed and went a different way home, that it was because they wanted to protect the child Jesus. But the fact of the matter is it's in the story and it has application for us today. We should go home differently after meeting Jesus. We really should. You know, I met Jesus for the first time, June 15, 1980. He became my savior. Oh, I had been to church growing up off and on with my grandparents. All, most of you that have been here for any length of time, you know the story that my mother was not a church goer and she did not raise me up in church. I never... I never went to church, and uh, I don't remember ever with my mom until I was 12 years of age. But at the age of, uh, well, just whenever I was with my grandparents, I remember going to church when I was five. You know, I made a profession of faith then, and I, I, you know, I wanted to be saved then. I just don't think I was old enough to understand, but at age 10, I clearly did. So I'd always been in the presence of the Lord whenever I went to church with my grandparents, but it was on June 15, 1980, that I met him. He became my savior. That day I went home with heaven as my destination. I went home that day with the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Now, I went back to California, and I didn't necessarily go to church, like I said, until two years later with my mom. But eventually in time, Meeting Jesus, it, it changed me. You see, after I got saved, <laughs> I couldn't just do whatever I want without any kind of repercussions. I couldn't just cuss and not feel bad. I couldn't just disobey my mom and, as a teenager and not feel bad. I mean, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter, I believe it's chapter 12, where it says God chastens us if we're his children. And when we do wrong, he corrects us and he scolds us and uh, wants to get us back on, on track. And he punishes us to, to make us aware that we should not live the way that, of the world. And you know what he said in that passage? He said, if I don't chasten you, it's because you're not my child. And I just sort of let you be. And it, I, got, I got changed. When I met my Savior, I no longer can just live in sin and party and drink and do drugs and cuss and miss church and just do all the worldly things that the unsaved people do without any bad feelings or without any conviction of the Holy Spirit. So now I'm changed. I want to do right. I feel badly when I disappoint my Savior, when I sin against him. And I have a desire now to go to church. I have a desire now to see people saved. I have a desire to serve my Lord. I, I'm different, and I hope I'm better. You know, you ought to be a different person because you met the Savior. No, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you're never going to do anything wrong. But you understand you need to be different. You need to be better. If Jesus Christ is inside of you, the Bible says you are a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Everything is different. Everything is better. And don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. I know some children that were raised in this church who are adults now. They want nothing to do with God. They did. They chose not to be better. They chose to ignore that Jesus lives inside of them. And they're living in the world just as godless, ungodly as can possibly be. But they're ignoring the Lord. Don't do that. Because you've met him, let him make you better. Let him make you different. Don't ignore him and be different because of him. Next, number four, look at Luke chapter two. We're almost done. Two more points. Luke chapter two, look at verse number six and seven. I like this one. Verse number six, it says in Luke chapter two, and so it was while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Now, it didn't stop there. The verse continues and it says, because there was no room for them in the end. Number five, four, of the five lessons, from the Christmas story. Write this down. Make room for Jesus in your life. And that word room, for us, it means time. Make time for Jesus in your life. You've heard me say this if you were here last night. You've heard me say this if you were here before. For whatever reason, I don't know all the circumstances, and I'm not just trying to cast stones at anybody. But the people that lived in that or that were staying in that inn, the inn was full. It was completely occupied, but nobody gave up their room for Mary and Joseph. Obviously, a, a woman that had been pregnant for nine months, obviously she began to be in labor while she was there on the property of the inn. The innkeeper, I believe, could have made room for them in his own home, his own dwelling. I'm sure he lived either on the property or very nearby, but nonetheless, it, it, it just, it, for whatever reason, they said no, and they said Go out where the animals are into a stable. And uh, we've got a spare stable where there are no animals or maybe their animals were there in the stable too at the same time. At least that's how the Christmas story shows it. But uh, uh, the fact of the matter is they didn't make room for him. It literally says because there was no room for them in the end. Now think about this thought. The room that you have to offer Jesus is your time. Every single person here has 168 hours a week. Don't say you don't have time for Jesus. Just don't say that. You do have time for him. You do. You can read your Bible. You can pray every single day of your life. If you have time to eat, you have time to read your Bible. If you have time to drink, you have time to pray. If you have time to do regular duties of life. You can do things for the Savior. In our day and age, modern technology, it is so easy to spend time with Jesus. You can, I, I, I told my, uh, someone recently, um, I said, I love listening to the Bible on my cell phone. I have an uh, Alexander Scorby app. It, it wasn't free. I think it costs $19.99. But he's my favorite narrator of the Word of God. I love his voice. I feel like there's just something special when he reads the Bible. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I love to not just read the Bible but to hear it. I think it's best if you can have your Bible open reading it and listening all at the same time. I think that's best. But I love to listen to the Bible in my ears through my, my cell phone app. With our modern technology, if you're not able to come to a church service for whatever reason, you can watch it live stream. If you're not able to watch it live, you can watch it as, as it's uploaded on our YouTube channel. I mean, there's so many opportunities for you to be acquainted and to make time for the Savior. In fact, if you want, you can listen to preaching seven days a week. You can listen to sermons. You can find good Bible preaching and Bible teaching sermons literally all over the Internet. Obviously, they're bad ones. You want to stay away from them. But there are good preachers, and their sermons have been uploaded, especially preachers from 
years gone by that are in heaven now, but a lot of their sermons have been left for us to listen to. I mean, there's so many ways that you can make time for Jesus in your life. Time be Bible time, prayer time, church time, uh, ministry, serving, living for him. You know, there's a verse in the Bible in Matthew 25 where it says, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Did you know that you can make time for Jesus that way as you go across your paths of life and you see people that you can be a blessing to in Jesus' name? You know, you've done it unto the least of these. You've done it unto him. Oh, my soul, make time for Jesus. Don't be like the innkeeper. Don't be like all those people that stayed in their in rooms and say, sorry, we can't help you. There's no room for you here. Don't live your life and say, sorry, Jesus. I'm just simply too busy. My schedule is just too tight. I just don't have time to read my Bible, to pray, to go to church, to watch online, to serve or live for you or anything. I just don't have time. Don't do that. Make room, make time for Jesus in your life. Again, I'm not casting stones at these people. I don't know all the details. I don't know the whys. I'm not saying that they hate God. The innkeeper was a God hater. I'm not saying that at all. But it's very clear that the Holy Spirit said, because there was no room for him, for them in the end. Don't let that be your testimony. Don't let it be said of you, there's no room for Jesus in your life. Number five and last, look at verse 15. Verse 15. It says this, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go, let us now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known, look at this, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. You know what that meant? They made known abroad the saying? That means this. When they left the presence of Jesus on, that, on, on the night that he was born, they went everywhere telling everybody they could, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Number five and last, I wrote this down. Share the glad tidings of great joy that we have been given a Savior. Share the glad tidings of great joy that we have been given a Savior. You know, that's the essence of soul winning. You see, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is, what experience you have, what teaching and training you have. Everybody can do something to share the glad news that, they, that people can be saved. At the very, 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 very least, you can hand out gospel tracts. My dad and I went to, uh, I got to see my dad on Friday night. I see my dad once a month, and usually when I go down and see him, we go out to eat. And this past Friday night, we went to Red Lobster, and we had a good meal. I love coconut shrimp. We had lobster. I had lobster, shrimp. Uh, additional shrimp and um, and um, uh, salmon, rice, how, uh, house salad with the best dressing of all, Thousand Island. I mean, that's just the absolute best dressing of all. And uh, and then we had those uh, you know Red Lobster uh, biscuits that we had before the meal came. You know, whatever those rolls or biscuits. I mean, just I just love Red Lobster. I mean, I really do. It's 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 a nice restaurant that's very affordable, at least in my in my price range. I know there are nicer restaurants. I've been to Fogo de Sean or Shoon or whatever, Fogo de Chow, whatever it's called, a Brazilian steakhouse. Man, that's a good place to go eat. But here's the thing. I said all that to say this. <clears throat> I was sitting there being served by the, the waitress, and she came, and she gave my, my dad paid it, you know, the bill, and she dropped off the, 
you know, the, 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 the bill for him to sign and everything. She was picking up our, 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 our dishes, and she was ending the night with us and said, thank you so much for coming here, and please come, you know, back again. And I went, looked at her and said, ma'am, before you go, I want to let you know something. I'm a pastor of a church up north in Longmont. I just wanted to give you this brochure. There's some Bible verses there that would be an encouragement to you if you'd like to read them. And she looked at me and she took it. She said, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And then she walked away. Folks, that's simple. Nobody should ever be petrified or say, I can't do this. Yes, you can. I mean, sometimes I just leave a track with a tip. Don't you dare leave a bad tip and put a gospel track with it. That's not good. <laughs> if you're going to leave a good tip, then, then just leave a gospel track. I mean, at the very least. But obviously, so many of us can do so much more. You can bring people to church, and they can get saved here. You can participate in soul winning as the silent partner or the main talker. I mean, there's so many ways. But here's the thing. The greatest story that's ever been told is that God sent his son to earth to us so that we could be saved. Let's not let that story never come out of our mouth. Let's spread it abroad. It says here, of those shepherds, and by the way, these weren't Bible college uh, graduates. These weren't preachers. They were just common folk that, that lived a common life, working a common job. And it says that they made known abroad the saying. What's the saying? Unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Why don't you do that? Why don't you say not just, a, by the way, I made an appointment today. God willing, I'll, I, I made an appointment. I, I, I led a lady to the Lord yesterday. Her husband wanted to get saved, but the family was like, hey, we got to go. We don't have time. We got, got someplace to go. But they said, you can come back tomorrow afternoon. They knew it was Christmas Day. God willing, I'm going to go back today after church, and I'll be able to talk to her husband and get to lead him to the Lord. I just led the lady to the Lord yesterday. I'm hoping it'll work out. But you know what? Not just on Christmas Day, but all throughout our lives. Let's be the type of people that share the glad tidings of great joy. What's that great joy? That we have been given a Savior. You can do that. If you are on social media, I, I, look, I, I told you, there's so many different ways to be a soul winner, so many different ways. If you have a Facebook account, I don't know much about Snapchat and Instagram. I do know a little bit about Twitter. I know there's now a Twitch. I mean, like, good grief, there's, there's so many of them. But on my Facebook account, I share the gospel. I invite people to church. I put scripture verses. I have a personal 13-minute video presentation of the gospel. It's on our YouTube channel for Hopewell Baptist Church. Any one of you can copy the link and share it on your social media. You could do it today. You could say, the reason Jesus, you could put a little note, the reason Jesus came to earth was so we could be saved and go to heaven. This is a short video of my preacher explaining how to be saved. Please watch it and then post it. I mean, that's a way you can Share the good news, the glad tidings of great joy that a Savior has been given. Oh, we should all do this. Five lessons from the Christmas story. Worship Jesus. Bring Jesus gifts of value. Be a different person because you met Jesus. Make time. Make room in your life for Jesus. And then share the glad tidings of great joy that we have been given a savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to be here this morning. What a, again, wonderful, wonderful crowd. At 8 a.m. on Christmas Day, I had no idea how many people were going to come this morning. I thought it could be a lot. It could be a handful. We might just have a half a dozen people here this morning. But during the 8 a.m. service, we have 24 people here this morning. I have no idea how many people are watching online, but I know there's some Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'm just, my heart is just overwhelmed and filled with joy this morning. Thank you, dear Jesus, for being such a great God. 
Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We don't have any first-time visitors this morning, but if anybody here needs to be saved, please don't put it off another day. No better day than Christmas Day to get saved. If you're here this morning and you need to be baptized, no better day than today. You can do that today. Let me know. We got the baptistry tank ready to go, nice and warm. You can get baptized. But before we start the invitation, let me ask you a question. How many of you are here this morning? One or more of those five points, those five lessons from the Christmas story, you would just be honest and say, Preacher, the Lord spoke to me about one or more of those five points. Would you please pray for me about what God spoke to me about? Would you raise your hand? Preacher, God spoke to me. Here's my hand. Oh, many hands. Wonderful. Father, you see the hands that are raised. I don't know how you spoke individually. They just simply acknowledged that you spoke. Lord, concerning what you spoke to them about, help them. Encourage them. Inspire them. Motivate them. Give them the strength they need. And then once they do what you have said, bless them for it. Lord, we love you. Thank you for being the best thing that has ever happened to mankind. Thank you for being such an amazing Savior. We love you. Amen. Shall we stand? The pianist will play. If God spoke to your heart, please come. Kneel and pray at the altar again. If anybody needs to be saved, if anybody needs to be baptized, please let me know. Heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.